Hi there. In today's lecture, we're going to talk about the way in which Chinese writing sort of evolved and changed over the early centuries. A very important quality in Chinese writing is that it has always been closely associated with the idea of statehood and statecraft and the government, whereas the earliest inscriptions, the Jiagowen, from the time of the Shang dynasty, we see these inscriptions dealing with a way of kind of communicating the values and needs of the empire to the gods. And so this is the way in which people of the government communicated with deities. And the language had this kind of sacred role as a sort of intermediary. And the pictures were things that the gods could understand. And it became a very important idea of communicating the legitimacy of the empire through this language. This idea was further elaborated on during the Western Zhou period when these inscriptions were put on the bronze vessels. This is a rubbing of an inscription which describes the reason why the bronze vessel was made and the honor that is being bestowed upon by the emperor. And so this way in which, again, the importance of the government and communicating and being a way of communicating values and ideas to these bronze vessels that were used to honor ancestors and deities, this way in which the language played this pivotal role of communication. An interesting change happens in writing with the invention of paper by Tsai Lung in 105 CE. Up until this point, we have inscriptions that have been done on wood, uh, carved or with a stylus written on bamboo slats, sort of woven together as we see here. Bamboo was very, very heavy, difficult to um, manage and maintain lots of lengthy writings and recordings and became a very important part of the government to have lots of documents to keep track of this huge empire. And so with paper, they have this extraordinarily inexpensive resource that is durable. It takes the ink beautifully and it is incredibly inexpensive to manufacture, and it's readily accessible. It basically is just using sort of leftover grasses and leaves. It could be built, made really easily. And so we see with paper making a process where grasses and leaves are kind of boiled and stamped and then uh, broken down into their basic fibers. The fibers they're put into a, a slurry of water and then sifted onto a very fine mesh sieve. The water falls out and the fibers realign themselves into this flat, durable paper, which is dried and pressed, hung out, um, and then given some sizing so that it has the sort of ability to tank ink with great control. And this process was fully developed in China 2,000 years ago, and it has in its elements all paper making today is essentially the same thing. It was a fully realized technology, and it only really comes into the rest of the world some 500, in some cases 800 years after its invention in China. Another development with paper was the use of a brush as a writing instrument. Now, a brush can hold a great deal of ink, uh, but it is very difficult to control. So as a tool for writing, it is not a, a easy to pick up tool. It takes a great deal of control and dexterity. But with exceptional skill, you can write longer and faster with a brush than you can with, say, a pen or pencil, because the movement is not uninhibited by actually touching the surface of the paper with any kind of friction, so your hand does not tire as quickly. The other technology that was important for this communication in calligraphy was the way that 
ink would be compressed into a stick. And so uh, the ink would be made and then it would be cooked down and, and mixed in a kind of wax binder. And then the stick of ink would be put in and rubbed into a tray of water. And so controlling the amount of blackness in the ink took a great deal of skill. So we have the brush, we have the ink stick, and then we have the dish where the ink is rubbed and it creates a little reservoir where you can draw your ink for painting. Now this is actually a fairly interesting brush ink stone that I saw in the museum in Indianapolis. Um, it's made of clay and you can see how there's a kind of mountain landscape around the background. And we'll talk more in a couple of lectures about the importance of landscapes as a source of inspiration, as a source of a kind of peaceful uh, tranquility where scholars could go and meditate and find the kind of inspiration for their poetical works. Notice also in the very center, kind of hidden in there, is a dragon. Another symbol of fertility, a symbol of inspiration and mystical power. And so this uh, stone for grinding ink is actually one of the earliest ones that have been found. And it's a lovely piece in extraordinary uh, good shape. And so this would have been something a scholar would have on their desk as a way of kind of inspiring them uh, to write. Holding the brush is also another skilled task. You very loosely and delicately hold the brush in a way that you really use your whole arm when operating the brush. Again, that allows for ability to write longer. You're not just using the muscles on your fingers. You're really using your whole arm and operating it in a very delicate fashion. There are eight basic brush strokes for all of calligraphy. These sort of basic strokes are practiced and have to have certain delineation and characteristics and the sort of way in which they are combined and the order in which they are put all make a difference in the formation of the calligraphy. Now let's look at just a simple straight line in the brush stroke and I'll show you how this can get quite complex. Here this straight line actually the the brush tip begins by going in the opposite direction to kind of form that corner and then quickly creates the stroke. There's a sort of a pause there this is as the ink begins to pool and then it kind of swirls about and then takes another line back in to create this kind of bone like shape. This is very Interesting because a lot of times they talk about brush strokes as bones, having bone structure. And you can see that every brush stroke must be done with this sort of complex dance like movement that must be natural. You can't think about it. You can't be like, okay, now I go here and here. It has to happen with this kind of quickness and fluidity with a kind of deep and long training. And that's the other part of literature. And calligraphy especially is that it takes a great many more hours to learn to do this than it does to write in, you know, sort of standard alphabet script like English. The other important characteristic of calligraphy is the brush stroke order. So typically you start at the top of the character and you move down and you move from the left to the right as you're forming the character. And so it's not only, it's important that the movement of the stroke and the direction of the stroke follow this very important predetermined pattern. Characters really are meant to sort of float in a space. They're believed to have a kind of box around them that the character needs to sort of rest in that space with a kind of sense of like a dancer moving, a kind of fluidity. There needs to be a sense of expressive vitality to the lines and the movement of each individual character. 
when people talk about calligraphy, they often talk about the sort of energy or force that moves through it, uh, that there's a sense of expression, that every part of the making of the calligraphy stroke is an expression of the individual writer, and that it, the sense of that communicating that Im important emotive personal qualities, that sense of refinement, that sense of control, but also that Im important expressive emotional force. And that this process of making is kind of embedded in the final product of each character. This expressive form is called the Xin Yin, the idea that this, each character is, in a sense, a kind of picture of the person who wrote it. One of the most celebrated pieces of calligraphy by anyone in the history of China is Wang Xi Shi Lang Ting Su, the preface to the collection of poems from the Orchid Pavilion written in 353 CE. Now, this was composed during a time in the Jin Dynasty, and during the life of Wang Zixi, this was immediately recognized as a monumental work, and it was copied, and uh, it was imitated uh, ever since, as this is the epitome of refinement and delicacy. Let me give you a little bit of a story behind this amazing piece of calligraphy. Wang Zixi had been invited to a party, and at the party, the guests uh, arranged themselves along a riverbank, and servants would float down this little river cups of wine. And if the cup of wine came to you, you were to drink it and then compose a poem on the spot, sort of spontaneously compose. And there was them there to write down these poems as they were being composed. And they've been composing poems all afternoon, these guests. And at the end of the day, uh, they asked Wang Cixi to compose a preface, uh, a kind of frontispiece, sort of introducing this volume of poetry that they had created on this lovely spring afternoon. And, and he sits down, he's had a bit of wine. And he creates this piece of calligraphy, sort of talking about the beauty of the day, the, the joy of being with friends and company. But he also reflects in a kind of melancholy way about how fleeting these memories are, that we more often are consumed by our sense of guilt or regret, and that these are the things that load on us as we grow older. And yet somehow it is these experiences, these moments of joy that are the real pride and promise of a long life. And it sort of uh, scolds us to look beyond those accumulated griefs and regrets and try and remember these beautiful moments. So this piece of writing by Wang Cixi, as I mentioned, is a tremendous achievement, and it's one that has said been copied and copied all the time. And he and his son, who have been known as the Two Wangs, are some of the most celebrated calligraphers in Chinese history. That on the anniversary of this writing, there are still people, many people in China, who take the time out to transcribe this preface to the Orchid Pavilion themselves as a kind of exercise in writing and honoring the past. So the collection is and becomes a very important document that tells us something about who Wang Cixi is. He becomes known as this man of great refinement, this sort of classic Confucian scholar that even during this time uh, was known for his calm reserve. But this image of Wang Cixi is actually sort of in, is challenged by what we know from other documents that have been sort of lost to time. Um, this particular letter, Letter on Disturbances, again is a copy of a copy from the Tang Dynasty, 
but we know it's Wang Cixi's writing, and he is in this case complaining about the desecration of his ancestral tomb and the great grief that has caused him that he cannot visit the tomb himself, even though it has been placed in order. I believe there was some flooding that affected his tomb. In this document, we see a much more distraught kind of writing. He's attacking the script. There's an emotional agitation and urgency that he communicates through his writing, not the calm, reserved scholar who is speaking about joys and pleasures, but instead we see a man who is deeply upset by the conditions of his ancestral tomb. And so we have to recognize that the, our historic picture of Wang Cixi is much more complicated than has come down to us, and that he found in his life, in this time of great turmoil in general, even he was not always the epitome of gentility. I want to step back from the subject of calligraphy for a moment and talk about the extraordinary pressures and challenges that scholars found themselves in in these roles as the bureaucrats and administrators in the government. There was enormous competition and there was fierce backbiting and fighting among the scholars. And for some, this meant that they needed to retreat from this. And a lot of what you see in the pictures we'll be talking about, the scholars are not writing about their life and their, their work in the city and dealing with all the bureaucracy and the business. Instead, we see them in the moments of leisure. We see them talking about um, moments of peace and tranquility, just as Mang Si Si um, sort of captured this idea of the Confucian spirit in writing about a, basically a drinking party in nature. Here we have the bamboo grove, the seven sages. Um, and these uh, scholars had come to us from about the same time, the third, the third century. And they are people who sort of gave up on all the fighting and and competition of being a scholar in the city, and instead retreated to their great wealthy estates, sat around drinking, composing poems, and enjoying life, and just kind of abandoning themselves to pleasure. They said, you know, why consume ourselves? There is no idea of, you know, bettering ourselves um, than just this sort of hedonistic enjoyment of life. And this is really in opposition to the overarching Confucian values. And I point this out because Confucianism was a very intense ideology that was very competitive and very strict. And so these seven sages of the bamboo grove uh, sort of harkens back to this idea of a kind of um, more innocent reverie of nature that has a kind of longing and powerful and palpable sense of retreat from the world. So even as people are sort of fighting in their, for their ambitions and their careers and their goals, there's this counter narrative of wouldn't you rather be fishing or wouldn't you rather be out in the woods having a drink with your friends and playing music? And this is uh, the sort of battling that's taking place in the, the ideologies of Confucianism. Now, in China, in the ninth century, we have evidence of the first woodblock print. This is a diamond sutra printed by Wang Jie, and this is an extraordinary work of art, a highly skilled, very refined woodblock print. The fact that this is the earliest example we have of woodblock printing in the world is notable. What's also remarkable is that it actually has a date on it, so we can date it very precisely. It's of such sophistication and such remarkable um, detail. The original print 
is a total of 16 feet in length. It's a scroll with a printed text of the Diamond Sutra, this Buddhist text that was included in a tomb. And it seems like it was made and printed um, specifically as a kind of way of honoring the ancestors who were buried within the tomb. This is 500 years before printmaking arrives in Europe. And it's done with this incredible sophistication and line work. In the image, we see the uh, Buddha, Sakyamuni Buddha, uh, surrounded by attendants. And then the supplicant is there um, being received in the presence of Buddha. I have a detail on the far left here where you can see the incredible precision in which the calligraphy has been created in this document. Now, a woodblock print requires someone with very fine tools to chisel away all the area that is not going to be printed. So the relief, the, the flat original surface, is then covered in black ink, and the cutaway parts are white. And so you have this raised surface, and you Creating a kind of delicate line work like the calligraphy in this case is astoundingly difficult. But notice the care at which they try and emulate the quality of brush strokes in the printing process. And this is something that continues on. Printmaking would continue in China. It was used with great skill and care. An early ambitious print productions included the entire Buddhist canon, more than 6,000 volumes. Now, the total number of copies, maybe 100 or so, were relatively small because it was not meant for general publication. The government controlled every aspect of printmaking, the wood, the ink, the paper. If you wanted to print something, it had to be done by royal decree, by the emperor had to say, we're going to print this. And so printing didn't have like a popular press, unlike Europe and elsewhere, where many people were kind of now printing and a kind of large explosion of printing became something that everyone had access to books. On the contrary, the reason they used printmaking was to make sure that there were exact copies of things, not that many people could read them, but what they made and what they said were exactly the same. That sense of consistency and conformity and mass production, which has been a part of Chinese culture for a very long time, found its way into the early stages of printmaking as well. So printmaking with woodblocks becomes important in communicating with writing because you can't really create like a letter press like we use in the West. Like Gutenberg had metal type and each letter was a special little piece and he could fit the letters together and you can set up pages. With calligraphy, the balance of each character and the relationship between the characters and its expressive ability to communicate is so important that woodblock printing becomes and maintains a very important way of reproducing written texts because calligraphy maintains its importance in Chinese culture and perhaps it becomes even more important with the arrival of printmaking. One of the interesting things that happens with calligraphy long after printmaking has made its way is that it becomes even more expressive, even more eccentric about the emotions and feelings of the writer. Here is uh, calligrapher Huang Qingqian, and here he is transcribing uh, the biographies of Lian Po and then Xiang Gru. In this text that he is sort of copying out, he is infusing his own emotional and individual passions into the calligraphy stroke. You look at the character of those lines. They're no longer sort of neatly holding into their little box, but this kind of running script gives this kind of force and expression to each of the characters and the way they are kind of linked together. Or as you see on the far left, last character that just sort of 
dives down the bottom of the page with this kind of emotional force. Because what Huang Tingqian is writing about, he's talking about this kind of feud between these two powerful generals. And he's sort of using this as a pretext to talk about his own battles at court. And he finishes his transcription. He includes his own personal note, which is, when two tigers fight, one must perish. I behave as I do. I put my country's fate before private feuds. Not long after this, he is banished. And so these kinds of passionate feuds that happened in, in the Confucian system meant that a lot of people were kind of wrestling with their fates and using calligraphy to express their deep-seated passions about their causes. Calligraphy, because it is connected to the ancestral past, because it has this source as a way of linking to the gods and a way of communicating with the gods, it needs to be disposed of properly. And even scraps of paper that are no longer needed should not just be balled up and thrown in the dustbin. They're meant to be taken to these shrines where they are burned. And this is a way in which people can you know, properly dispose of Chinese characters and respect that legacy and that history. Another really interesting place to find calligraphy, if you're walking through a public park in China, you might see on some of the polished flagstones in the park, someone taking, having taken a large brush and began writing out passages of poetry or their own personal statements in beautiful calligraphy in water. Now the water, as it's applied to the stones, provides a kind of dark line that can be read for an hour or two before it evaporates. And so this becomes a way people can make political statements, personal comments. The message is there for a moment, and then it vanishes without a trace. Calligraphy, as we will talk about more, has this power, a kind of moral authority. It has uh, beautiful calligraphy, especially sort of commands people's attention. If you write it beautifully, it must be true. And so it is a highly guarded and careful practice that people say things with their beautiful calligraphy that is a way to kind of command people's attention and direct their respect to the issues and ideas that they think are important. Let's have a review quiz. Question one, how do Chinese characters work? Question two, what is the significance of paper in China? Question three, how are Chinese characters written? Question four, what is the significance of the preface to the Orchid Pavilion? Question five, how was printmaking used in China?